This is the Vic Fizzell Show podcast, hosted by Vic Fizzell and Jonathan Zimmick, sponsored by Moroso Wood Fired Pizzeria and Pinewood Coffee Roasters. As long as I was going after the crooks that didn't have badges, I was everybody's hero. We're back, Vic. Hey, Jonathan. It's We're good back to in be action. back. Had a good time. Yeah, doing uh, two weeks of Jason Baldwin. Jason Baldwin, wasn't he a great interview? He's he a cool guy. Cool guy. Loved meeting him, getting to know him. Uh, love uh, his foundation. I want to help them raise money. Yes. Uh, I hope there are some lawyers in Austin listening who will donate some of their time. That'd be the greatest thing. Yeah, wouldn't it? Be good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because like, like he said, the most expensive part about proclaimed justice and what they have to do last is bring in the attorneys because they're so expensive for their time. So that's, anybody who can donate, yeah, pro bono. That's what Jason said, is that the lawyers are the ones that cost the most, so they bring them in at the last minute. There's got to be some lawyers out there who are wanting to get in some pro bono hours. Yeah. I mean, I put in... Hundreds a year. <laughs> you do you do a little more than yeah. necessary. I even got an award for it last year. This year, the podcast has kept me busy, so I haven't done as much pro bono. Well, you're you're doing some pro bono stuff tomorrow, even on a case, right? Probably will turn out to be pro bono because there isn't any way I, he's ever going to be able to pay. Yeah. <laughs> but I hate seeing injustice. Yes. And this is an injustice that's taken place and. I must step up to the plate and do what needs to be done, whether I ever get paid or not. Now, don't take that as as an invitation to call me, because (laughs) I'm telling you, my plate is full. If you've got a car wreck, if you've been hit by an 18-wheeler, oh, we want that. uh, We've got a staff here ready to handle your case against the insurance company. But uh, on wrongful convictions and... Louisiana, Pennsylvania, Montana. Hey, we got a Louisiana one today, right? We did. And I wish I could help, but I'm only licensed to practice in Texas right. and in the federal courts in Texas. Uh, so there are a lot of good people in your home state. Reach out to them. Reach out to the Innocence Project and some of the other good foundations. Like that Proclaim that Justice. Proclaim Justice, yeah. And, awesome. Uh, I hope we can raise some money for them. I hope we get enough coffee sales. Right. And we can raise some money for them. We a dollar from every bag, Vic. A dollar from every bag goes to Proclaim Justice. Yep. And uh, we sold our very first international order. We did. When, yesterday? <laughs> yeah, yeah, went out to the UK. Shipped out to the UK yesterday. So thank you for that order. Uh, we've got bumper stickers on the way. Uh, check out our website, vicfazell.com. Uh, look at our merchandise so that we can keep this valuable ministry on the air. Buy a t-shirt, <laughs> uh, some coasters, and uh, look at our bumper stickers that are coming. Uh, buy some coffee so we can give a dollar to proclaim justice. And then uh, the bumper stickers, were, they're, they're left over from the 80s, but we're <laughs> reprinting them. Yes. We're taking off the... Vintage. Vintage. Yeah. Unofficial. Yeah. We're taking off the, the thing that says uh, paid for by the Vic Fazell campaign, blah, 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 because there ain't no Vic Fazell campaign. So we're just calling them Vintage Unofficial. Yeah. But they're your old uh, re-election campaign bumper stickers, uh, ones that say uh, victory, go get them, Vic. Honk if you hate Channel 8. And <laughs> Vic Fazell for district attorney. Yeah. I would like to see that bumper sticker all over the United States. That would be amazing. Not because I'm running for district attorney Unless anywhere. I'm not. But I would like for more of the district attorneys to have the kind of mindset that we've been talking about on this show. Yes. I'd like for more of the district attorneys in our country to have the mindset that it shows that I had uh, on the confession killer. Right. And if you haven't watched the confession killer yet, watch it. Yeah. It's on Netflix. Uh, I don't show up until the end of episode two, but I'm most of episode three, and I'm in it in number four and number five. Right. And we've gotten so many uh, responses from all over the world saying, wow, Vic, we need more DAs like you. True. And so put this sticker on your car as a symbol to your own district attorney. Do what's right, not what's easy. 
do what's right. I like him. Yeah. I like it. Hey, Mikey, he likes it. Mikey. Well, cool. And today's going to be a cool episode, Vic. We have like a ton of cool stuff to talk about. Um, one of them is going to be talking about the read interview technique, which yeah. was brought up by Jason Baldwin. Yeah, because they used that technique on Jason. Yes. Uh, in the West Memphis 3 case. They also used it on Corey Wise in the uh, Central Park 5 case. And if you haven't seen When They See Us, mm-hmm. uh, go watch that. It's a multi-part episode, a uh, multi-part series that you can binge watch. Yeah. And I'm telling you, that actor that played Corey Wise... So good. So good. I mean, they were all fabulous. Yeah. They're all fabulous. But the guy just captured Corey Wise. I mean, uh, it was so good. And then we'll be talking about the read technique and why it is they center in on people like Corey Wise and right. Jesse Miss Kelly. Right. Yeah. Right. Now we're going to talk about a cold case here, Vic. The murder could have happened here. Either way, they found a body up in Fort Worth belonging to a Waco woman. Yeah, Lily Hefley. We'll be talking about that. And I think Lily was killed. I don't think she was killed in Fort Worth. And I know she wasn't killed in that car. Right. If you go and shoot somebody in a car, right. there's going to be blood all over the car. Not to mention like exit wounds, bullets, you know, embedded, yeah. I would imagine, right? Yeah, in, in casings, the behind. Uh, whatever. Uh, even powder residue, perhaps, on a seat or something like that. Right. No evidence that she was killed in the car or that she was killed in Fort Worth. She was last seen in McLennan County. Right. More than likely, she was murdered in McLennan County and transported uh, in her own vehicle up to uh, up to Fort Worth. Trippy. Which means it was probably a two-man job. Possibly. At least disposing of the body, because how are you going to do that? you going to drive her car up there, leave it, and then hitchhike back? Ask Henry. Yeah, ask him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know well, I would do you it. know, we, we hitchhiked all the way to Japan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If Henry had been around 40 years ago... He would have claimed this one. He would have. <laughs> uh, of course. Why wh- wouldn't he? Why wouldn't when, he? When was the date of the Lily Hefley murder? 1908? Well, he was around back then. I'm surprised they didn't get him to uh, confess to, to Lily Hefley's murder. He did it. Yeah, me and Otis picked her up on the side of the road. She was hitchhiking out of uh, Shreveport. Yeah, that's the ticket. No, that's Henry, the, you got that wrong. If you're going to keep saying Shreveport, I'm not going to talk to you about this case anymore. Uh, well, could it have been Round Rock? There you go, Closer, Henry. Yeah, so. Oh, man, oh, man. And so then, there's uh, a lot of good stuff about Lily Hefley and Paul Gately. With Channel 10 and Waco, KWTX, did a news story about it last night. As a matter of fact, I saw it this morning. I saw you on the news, Vic. Was I on there? You were on the news. I did not see that. (laughs) If you you can find a clip of it, send it to me. I'd like to see it or post it on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was on there talking about it because there's some disagreement in McLennan County about whether McLennan County even has jurisdiction to investigate. Well, I'm telling you. As a former DA, I know that McLennan County has jurisdiction to investigate this case. Right. Uh, And it's one they ought to investigate. She was a resident of McLennan County. She was last seen in McLennan County. Her family reported her missing from McLennan County. She had no reason to go to Fort Worth. The reason that was given by her ex-husband was debunked by her children no way she would drive to Fort Worth for a recipe when she could have taken it over the phone. Weird. You know? And she didn't know anybody in Fort Worth. Her own daughters say this. Wow. And the interesting thing about this case is that when they found Lily Hefley's body, mm-hmm. a cigar had been put out, had been snuffed out on her body. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Well, 40 years ago, we didn't have DNA comparison. But we do now. Today we do. And so DNA needs to be done on this cigar. Uh, Paul Gately has written all kinds of freedom of information requests to the Fort Worth police, Mm -hmm. trying to figure out what's going on, and they won't answer him. They keep referring his request to the attorney general. Right, right. Well, you know, how long have they had this cigar? This is a 40-year-old case. How long does it take to do DNA comparison? Seriously. And and the suspects on this case are just a handful. Right. And so it wouldn't take much to compare it to the handful of suspects. Right. Uh, there's 
Now, Captain January with the sheriff's office here says they have jurisdiction, and I agree with Captain January on that. They have jurisdiction to investigate. When I was DA, if there was a nexus in McLennan County, Mm -hmm. we could reach across county lines. We could even subpoena across county lines. During the Lucas special grand jury, we had evidence coming in from all over the United States. Right, right. We were investigating murders that happened in Pennsylvania. In New Jersey, in Louisiana, in California, uh, because it shed light on the three that were uh, murdered here in McLennan County, the three he had confessed to here. Right. So it's called nexus jurisdiction. If there's a nexus, if there's a connection, you can go looking. Now, once you get it investigated, your court may not have jurisdiction to prosecute it. Fair enough. But you most certainly have jurisdiction to investigate it. And if I were with the sheriff's office here or the DA's office, I would be on those people at the crime lab every day saying, where are the results of the DNA comparison on this cigar? Yeah, man. And I got to tell you, the witnesses to this that they've interviewed about this know one suspect who smoked that brand of cigar. Wow. Yes. And somebody who may have had a motive. Well, uh-huh. there you go. Yeah, there, justice there's a will motive. Be done. I, I don't want to talk about it too much because I, I hope that the uh, sheriff's office here is working on it. Captain January in the report says they're working on it. I hope they're just kicking it every day. He, he came off really well in, I the, thought in so. the video interview. Sounds like he's he's really going after it. Oh, and good. it sounds like the McLennan County Sheriff's Office here are really good about trying to close these, these cold cases that are like 40 years old. I think they said they had one from the 50s that they're still looking into, but they've actually had success, as said, in like indicting five people, and I guess they're just about to sentence one on all these old cold cases. So they're going back through, and that's awesome. That's That's what we want to see. That's excellent. And most of it is done these days with the DNA comparison. Right. Like uh, Jason was talking about, it's either DNA or you have to get out there and do real investigative work. You know, and that's the hard part, the real investigative work. This could be a very easy case to solve, the case of Lily Hefley. And if you want to see more about it, go to the KWTX uh, website mm-hmm. and watch the interview, which I haven't seen yet, but I'll look at it tonight. And we'll, we'll post it up on our website today. It's posted on our website. I've also got it on my personal uh, Facebook page. Cool. I took my Facebook page down a couple months ago after, after my son Greg died. Uh, because it just uh, couldn't handle it. Just had too much communication, and the family needed time to grieve. And uh, but I re-upped it this week. You're so back. he's I'm back. Back. <laughs> I'm back on Facebook. I'm promoting the podcast, and I posted Paul Gately's article about Lily Hefley. And also, there's a a petition circulating. Oh. And I posted a link to the petition so that you can sign the petition urging law enforcement to do whatever it takes to get this DNA tested and compared to the suspects that we already know about. Yep. Yes. It's so simple. It's so simple. It can be done. Let's get it done. You know, when we've got cases like this languishing because we need the manpower and the money to do something about it, Mm -hmm. Yet we still have the police going around and arresting young people for small amounts of marijuana, (laughs) messing up their lives, tying up cops in in court on cases that under the new hemp law, they're probably not going to be able to even prove. Right. We're not even letting our marijuana clients plead guilty because we don't think they're going to be able to prove it. Right. Not under the state of the new law. So policemen, uh, prosecutors, Start looking at some of these murders. Yeah. Uh, let's do what it takes to get these solved and get off of other people's backs. Yeah. Quit harassing people over silly little crap that kids used to get away with 30, 40 years yeah, right. ago. Just consider, you know, mischief. Go to your room. You know, <laughs> not you got a record for the rest of your life and we're going to ruin your career and your yeah, chances for a scholarship. It's not fair. No, it's not fair. People getting fired, people getting their their automobiles uh, repossessed because they can't afford to pay all the court fees and things. It's mm-hmm. just not fair. 
Let's do stuff like this. Folks, solve Lily Hefley's murder. It's a case whose time has come. It's overdue. It's 40 years overdue. 40 years overdue. Even if you have to go overseas and extradite somebody back, do it. Yep. Do it. So anyway, Lily Hefley, read about that. Interesting case. Cool. From a, 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 a young lady who was murdered, I believe, right here in Waco, Texas. Ooh. Let's get it solved. Love it. Love it. What do you think, Vic? Has this uh, come to the point where we read our usual reviews? Should Let's I, do should it, I do Jonathan. A review? Yes, sir. I like this one. This one is from Valerie Roberts. It says, hello, Vic and Jonathan. Hi, Valerie. Hey. Wow, Vic, what a life you have led. This podcast is amazing, and you and Jonathan play off off each other oh so well, and you make me laugh. Hey, thanks, Valerie. I never realized just how many people that the deep state had going after you. I mean, poor criminal lawyers in Waco had the heat on them, too. And she's right. They did. This is seriously a whole movie. Oh, speaking of Yeah, it should be. It should be. (laughs) Call me Spike Lee. (laughs) I'm waiting for you to call me back, dude. I agree with that. You got my number. He does, doesn't he? He, he does. He to yeah, we talked. We he and I talked with each other in uh, Florida, in Florida, in Miami. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, there's pictures of us together. Yeah, I love it. Valerie continues. I hate how people get used and abused during this whole thing, and you have always talked great about Ranger Ryan, and now he still talks smack. About you on Netflix. Yeah. I can't even imagine what they do or could do to regular old people like myself. Yeah, that's true. It's very true. That's true. What they do is they make a case on you if they don't like you, and they lock you up for the rest of your life. Crazy. I'm so very sorry for what you and your family and friends have gone through, and I'm so glad that you are still being proven right 35 years later. I think old Henry was a bit smarter than we all give him credit for, but there's absolutely no way he could have had sex or raped anybody. And That's she's true. Right. She's right. Also, you have the most interesting <laughs> guests like Hugh, Lynn, and Doug. I learned a lot from the podcast. Also, please don't take Jonathan to hot yoga anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Valerie. <laughs> yeah. I'm not crazy enough to go to hot yoga again. You don't no. smoke weed with Willie, you don't go to yoga with Vic. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Or either one can make you pass out. Yeah, yeah. it's totally true. Um, and then she says, honestly, when you do the right thing, you learn who your true friends are. And uh, trust me, I've lost, a lot of, I've lost a lot of friends and family because of standing up to bullies. But Jesus was prosecuted for doing the right thing. You, as well as so many, are in pretty dang good company. That's true. Thank yes. you, Valerie. So, well yeah. written, well thought out. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. And she's totally right about the yoga. Yes, she is. Yeah. Spot on. Yeah. All right, Vic, so let's segue into this cool article you found. And we're talking about a gentleman by the name of Gerald Goins, and he was a Houston police officer. I know. So why don't you start this article off, because you're the one who found it. I'll I'll give you the the opening. Well, this article came out only four hours ago. This is breaking news. Now, this Gerald Goins, he did a lot of bad things. He is a policeman in Houston. Harris County District Attorney Kim Ogg says that prosecutors have identified 69 individuals who may have been convicted on false evidence from former Houston narcotics officer Gerald Goins. Yeah, so here's a guy who was planting that, <clears throat> planting drugs on people. Yeah. We've seen this done before, but... Why do they God. think they have to do that? I mean, there are plenty of really guilty people out there instead of going and planting drugs on somebody that that didn't have them. Well, what do do you personally think it is? Do you think he has a vendetta against people? Do you think he just found people he didn't like? Or do you think he was trying to meet quotas? It's probably a little all of it and probably a lot of ego. Yeah. Just wanting to keep the numbers going, wanting to be that stud out there making all these big cases, you know. Gerald got another one. Whoa. Uh, Good job, Gerald. And unfortunately, on drug cases, a lot of times it boils down to simply racism. True. If you'll look at the people getting arrested for drugs, especially for weed, it's mainly black people and Mexican-Americans. Right. And Gerald was an African-American. He was. Yeah. And it says in January, a grand jury indicted Goins. Right. On two charges of felony murder 
and a charge of tampering with a government record. Felony murder? Yes. This guy was bad. Well, I, I looked into this, and he and some other folks at the police department fabricated a ton of stuff to be able to get an illegal search warrant on a house that they said were, you know, heroin dealers or something in there. They rolled in and killed them. <laughs> killed them both. Shot shot the dog first. Shot the dog which first. Which created a firefight, which resulted in five officers being shot. None of them died, but these two individuals inside the house were killed. And and they were just innocent civilians. Correct. They were not drug pushers. Correct. They were not drug manufacturers. And uh, Goins made this case against them and against their house. It's crazy. And then killed their dog. And, and then I, killed the dog. I know what that's like. They killed my spanky. dog. Spanky. Yeah. Poor they, spanky. They always kill the dog. Yeah. They killed this guy's dog. They killed my dog. The first victims at Ruby Ridge were the dogs. Nah. The first victims at the at the Davidian camp were the dogs. Wow. They show, They always shoot the dogs first. They say we kill the dogs so that they don't warn you that we're coming. Or they don't warn you that we're illegally tapping your phone. The main reason they kill the dog, kill your dog, is to intimidate you. Yeah. To demoralize you. To hurt you. Because for most people, their dog is a beloved member of the yeah. family. It's like killing a family member. <laughs> but because it has four legs, the DEA, the FBI, they think they can get away with it. Mm -hmm. And so they just... Right off the bat, let's kill the dogs. It's not fair. Not, not fair, fair at all. Where's PETA when you need them? Yeah, right. Do Peta. something about yeah, it's this. Peta. Where's PETA when you need them? Jeez. So on Wednesday, prosecutors filed motions requesting that judges appoint lawyers for these 69 individuals so that they can begin the process of possibly having their goings-related convictions overturned. Wow, that's a lot of manpower. Yeah. It's going to cost a lot of money to undo what this guy did. What one person did. Mm -hmm. Gosh. And truth be known, once they get into this, they're going to find out it wasn't just him because you can't do this by yourself. It mm -hmm. takes either willful ignorance from your compadres. Right. Or it takes somebody co-conspiring with you. Mm -hmm. uh, according to the district attorney's office, Og has concluded that defendants in cases during the period from 2008 and until 2019, in which Goyne played a substantial role, are entitled to a presumption that he provided false evidence to secure their convictions. Wow, man. So that means that they've got, the state has a presumption to overcome. We're just going to presume that Goyne's provided uh, false evidence. Yeah. And we've seen this so many times, and we wonder why is there violence on the streets? Why does it take just one little thing to get a riot started yeah. with fires and broken windows and looting and all of that stuff? It's because people are so frustrated. Yeah. It's because the citizens are starting to become polarized against law enforcement. Oh, totally. And vice versa. And it's because of Gerald Goins related people. It takes one apple to ruin a bunch. And it's so sad. Vic. It's so sad. And I'm impressed that somebody must have ratted on this guy, or at yeah. least somebody is cooperating with the DA's office. Somebody is crossing that thin blue line yeah. and doing what's right instead of what's just always easy. I like it. I like it, too. I endorse it. I endorse it. <laughs> he said, uh, Og said, we need to clear people convicted solely on the word of a police officer whom we can no longer trust. The district attorney's office says most of the cases involve delivery of a controlled substance and nearly all resulted in loss of liberty, ranging from a few months in the Harris County Jail to four years That's in crazy. the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. So he was getting them not just for possession, right. but for delivery, wow. claiming they were selling it. Uh, Goins was the sole witness to the offense in all these cases, the district attorney said. You know, after a while, you got to get suspicious, man. It's like, yeah. why wasn't anybody suspicious of Henry Lucas? Right. Why, why, why wasn't anybody else suspicious? Now, some people were, and they figured out what was going on, uh, like the police officer from Dallas. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But even after they found out what was going on, they kept their mouth shut. Yeah, this let it let yeah. the train keep on rolling. Let old Boutwell's train, Prince's train, just keep on rolling. Well, somebody stopped Mr. Goins' train, and yeah. I'm, I'm glad about that. Lawyers for each defendant would review whether the evidence presented by Goins was material in convicting their client. If so, they would decide whether to request a new trial. Yeah. Well, you know, request wow. that new trial, guys. Don't yeah. be intimidated. Request that new trial. Don't request it. Stand on this ruling and demand it. Yeah. Because if if the uh, Fourth Amendment was violated, mm -hmm. that, that dope's not coming in. Yeah. And they have a presumption to overcome. Right, right. It's going to be presumed that if Goins was involved, that it was a dirty case. God. Og recently asked judges in uh, two 2008 narcotics cases to rule that uh, brothers Stephen and Otis Millette were the victims of false evidence presented by Goins and were actually innocent. And the judges agreed that the cases against the brothers were a fraud. That's crazy. Fraud. And you have to think, Vic, when, when you're thrown in prison for something you didn't do, think of your families, your job, every, you lose everything, all based on one individual in the presumption that what they say is the truth. I know. Crazy. That's because in this country, we've got things upside down. Yeah. Our Constitution says that a defendant is presumed innocent. Right. Presumed innocent until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. But if you walk into the courtroom and the potential jurors are looking over at that defendant's chair, the first thing they're thinking is, I wonder what he did. Right. Not, I wonder what he's accused of. Right. But I wonder what he did. They walk in automatically thinking that he's guilty. Well, people, that is not what our Constitution says we're supposed to do. Right. And our Constitution is talked about a lot. It's talked about as much in this country as the Bible. Yeah. And it's one of the least read documents in this country, including the Bible. You got people waving the Bible all the time who've never even read it. Yeah. You know, you got people yakking about the Constitution all the time, and they've never even read it. Yeah. So read the Constitution. Google it. See what your rights are and stand up for your rights. Because if he violated the Fourth Amendment here and it looks like he did, yes, uh, then that evidence isn't coming in and all these people should walk. Yep. All of them. And not to say that all 69 are innocent. I, I will throw that that part out there because a couple of them could, could obviously still be guilty, but they're all due process at this point, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they all need to be looked at because they're all tainted because of what this one policeman did. So so kudos to the people who turned them in. Yeah, and, and to District Attorney Kim Og for doing the right thing. Right. Kudos to Kim Og. Thank you for standing up for what's right, even if it means standing up against the police. You know, and one of my soapboxes that I like to get on is that the, <laughs> the DA is not the lawyer for the police. Right. The DA is supposed to be a buffer between the police and the citizens. Yes, prosecuting crimes. Yes, convicting criminals. But number one, seeing that justice is done. And oftentimes justice means not indicting that bad case, sending that case back to the police department when there's not enough evidence there. Right. You know, go get me another witness statement. Bring me something else. Uh, otherwise, if I, if I were the DA, I'd, you don't want to go do your jobs, right? Policeman. Well, then I'll just take this to the grand jury and let them no bill it. Right. And then you can go complain about the grand jury. <laughs> you know, I don't Gosh. know why more DAs don't use the grand jury. That's a really good question. So when, when you buy a pound of coffee from us or not a pound, what is it? 10 ounces, 10 ounces, 10 ounces. So that, that's a, that's a. 2020 pound, 10 ounces. <laughs> I remember when a pound was a pound. I miss those days. I remember when a dime bag used to cost a dime. <laughs> oh, I never remember that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're going to put bumper stickers in with our coffee. You yep. order a T-shirt, we'll put a bumper sticker in because we want to start a movement. And our movement is uh, Vic Fazell for DA. In other words, do the right thing. 
do the right thing. So get that bumper sticker, put it on your car, and let it be a message to your sitting DA that if they don't do the right thing, that maybe some young guy like I used to be is going to come forward and run against them. And if they get in, they can fire some of the bullies like I did and start doing the right thing. I like it. I like it, Vic. Yeah. I like it. Well, hey, let's transition over to our third and final <laughs> topic. And yeah. This one's a long one because this one's crazy. And this is the read technique of interviewing. Yeah. This was the primary technique used while I was DA. Really? As part of the reason I had some some problems with some of the confessions that I saw. Okay. I was familiar with this technique when I was DA because I, I had come out of MHMR, mental health, mental retardation. Right, right. I had worked for them for seven years before I went back and finished law school. And then two years later, ran for DA. So I knew about this technique. I knew about how people can be uh, softened up psychologically through long interviews, mm -hmm. through accusations, uh, through intimidation. And uh, that's part of the reason I had a problem with Lucas's confessions. Yeah. They just didn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, it's part of the reason I kept sending them back to the drawing board on the Lake Waco murder cases. Mm -hmm. I did not care for this read technique and this, this kind of interview technique. Uh, but when they came up with the bite mark evidence, which is not totally discredited. Yeah, don't throw the baby yeah, out with the bathwater. Don't throw water. the baby out with the bathwater. Bite mark evidence is the same as tool mark evidence. If you squeeze a pair of pliers down on your thumb, it's going to leave a mark. Well, that mark can be photographed, and you can figure out probably which pair of pliers, say there are 10 pair of pliers out here on the table, you can figure out which pair of pliers left that mark because all the tools that come off an assembly line have their general characteristics. They're all pretty much alike when they come off the assembly line. Mm -hmm. But you use it once, you use it twice, you use it 10 times, you're going to have little nicks here, little breaks there, little scratches here. And those are called individual characteristics. Mm -hmm. So you have your general and then you have your individual. And those individual characteristics are how you can determine, well, which one of those 10 pair of pliers made this mark or which pair of tennis shoes left that uh, uh, muddy footprint on the floor. Right. We actually use that kind of evidence on uh, on a murder case that I prosecuted with local attorney Dave Deaconson. He was an assistant DA with me back then. Melody Bolton was murdered up in West. Mm -hmm. And some of our evidence there was the muddy uh, shoe print. And we were able to identify that shoe print, figure out which brand of shoe it was, wow. and match it to the shoes that the guy was wearing that night. Wow. Uh, they were taken out of his house when he was arrested. Huh. And right there on the ball of the big toe was a chunk that had been taken out where he had stepped on a rock or something like that. Wow. And that was in all the muddy footprints across the white carpet. Wow. So we were able to use that. So that, and bite marks are the same as that. Sure, sure. Unfortunately, uh, people figure out how to make money off of some of this stuff. They start touting themselves and then as an expert and saying, trust me, trust me, trust me. Well, remember, we read the article about the government doing that. Yeah. And how yeah. it all had to be discredited because they were straight up lying about and a lot of stuff. And where had it started? The FBI. Yeah. The FBI. And then they started training everybody else how to do it. And how to do it wrong. So Crazy. this read technique, it was started... In the 50s. In the 1950s by a guy named John E. Reed, an American psychologist, polygraph expert, and former Chicago police officer. Yep. Critics of the technique, it's a psychological method, charge that it can elicit an unacceptably high rate of false confessions from innocent people, especially juveniles. Juveniles and people with uh, low IQs. Low IQs. And in the uh, West Memphis Three, Jesse Miss Kelly. Yep. Low IQ. I can't remember if he was a juvenile or not, but if he wasn't, he barely was. He was like 17, I think. Yeah, something like Maybe. that. And Maybe. then in the Central Park Five, Corey Wise. Right. Uh, low IQ. So they center in on Corey. 
and they used the Reed technique on Corey. They pinned him down, just like how Boutwell did Lucas, and rehearse, 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 and then they get him to sign something. Then they get him to say it in front of somebody else. Then they got him pinned down, and before you know it, they've implicated two or three other people, like in uh, Jesse Miss Kelly's case. He, right. he barely knew those other two boys. Right, right. He didn't know Jason. They'd been around him just a little bit. And and Jason and uh, uh, Damien weren't that close. Right. So, and, and their lawyers didn't even bring it out in court. It's crazy. The prosecutor made it look like they were three running buddies that were always together. Well, always they together weren't. Scheming. They weren't. Wow, man. What's, in, uh, in 1955, in Lincoln, Nebraska, this uh, John Reed helped gain a confession from a suspect named Daryl Parker. Uh, got a confession to his wife's murder. And the case established Reed's reputation and popularized, popularized his technique. But Parker recanted his confession the very next day. But since he had signed it, guess what, Jonathan? It goes into evidence. So it was admitted into evidence at his trial, and he was convicted by a jury and sentenced to life in prison. He was later determined to be innocent. Uh Uh Uh-oh. (laughs) Uh-oh. Oh, no. After being convicted and sentenced to life in prison, another man confessed and was found to have been the actual perpetrator. That's crazy. So then Parker sued the state for wrongful conviction and it paid him 500000 in compensation. Ah, now, so, so right off the bat. <laughs> yeah. Fumble. So, and, and see, and this is something this, the state of Arkansas did to, uh, to the West Memphis Three, right. making them do that offered plea. They, right. weren't, they, they weren't able to sue for wrongful conviction. It's crazy. It was so dishonest. So dishonest. And I still believe to this day the reason Stephen Avery is in prison is because he had won that 30 something million dollar verdict against the state for wrongfully imprisoning him the first time. Right. So then what do they do? They come back and wrongfully imprison him again. Yep. Shut him up. Yeah. They shut him up and now they don't have to pay the 38 million. Right. Now here's here's what I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. Why shouldn't they have to pay the 38 million anyway? Right? Even if he did the second murder, which I will do not believe he did. I don't, do, I don't believe he did. It don't either. believe it at all. Right. But even if they did, he was still wrongfully convicted before. Yeah, really. So do they just get a free ride? Right. I mean, this stinks. It stinks to high hell. Yep. I mean, anytime I pick a jury, I'm going to ask that. Have, have, have you seen Making of a Murderer? Yeah. Do you think Stephen Avery did it? Right. And if they say, yeah, I don't want him on my jury, man. Yeah. I'm going to do anything I can. So if you're listening and you don't want on a jury, it's a criminal <laughs> jury, just say, I think Stephen Avery did it. And you're probably going to walk. That's so, funny. Yeah. But, you know, in that case, this method was also used on Brandon Dassey, which was Stephen Avery's nephew, the one with the lower IQ. Yes, it was. Yep. Yeah. The, and he's the one who was represented by Laura Nyrider. Right. Yeah. That we met. Stuff. That we met down in Austin. Two or three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great young lawyer who's got her own podcast now. She does. Do you know the name of it? I don't. Oh, man. I think it's called Wrongful Convictions, but you can just Google her, Laura Nyrider, N-I-R-I-D-E-R, and she and her her partner, I can't remember his name, but he's good too. And I've listened to a couple uh, episodes, and it's good. Cool, man. I don't want to... Uh, so listen to our podcast, but you know if we don't have another one out and you need a podcast to we'll listen to, we'll let you go over to their camp yeah, for a little bit. We'll listen to it, and also don't forget about uh, dialogue. Yeah, D I E slash a log <laughs> with Rebecca. Cool man. Yeah. So the the basic premise though of the re technique is that it's it's psychological in nature. It's coercing a confession. Yeah. You first you go in. And you're not aggressive. Oh, man, I'm so sorry you're here. Uh, we're going to get you home by, by, by supper, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And then it goes on and on and on. And then it gets more aggressive and more aggressive and more aggressive. And the reason they're be- nice in the beginning is to try to gain your trust. Get a little report. Get a little report and get you to admit to something. 
right. to anything. And the way they do that is with alternative questions that uh, assume facts that aren't there. Right. It, yeah. and, and I think they actually call it an accusatory process. Exactly. An accusatory process. The read technique is a three-phase process. Fact analysis, behavior analysis, and then they get into these nine steps that are the accusatory the process. The nine-step program. The nine-step <laughs> program, yeah. Uh, they, they tell the suspect that uh, their investigation clearly indicates that you committed this crime. We've got evidence that says you did it. We have DNA. We have fingerprints. We have an eyewitness. We have this, that, or the other. And the innocent person is sitting there going, what? What? Because it's all a lie. It's all a lie. Uh, this interrogation begins in the form of a monologue. It's right. not even them asking questions. It's not even questions. back and forth. It's not. Just, it's just the policeman talking. And the monologue is presented by the investigator. And it's not a question and answer format. The demeanor of the investigator during the course of an interrogation is ideally, uh, it's understanding, it's patient, it's non-demeaning. And then they get into, uh, and then they ask a question like, well, did you plan this out or did it just happen on the spur of the moment? Right. So this alternative uh, question, it's based on an implicit assumption of guilt. Right, right. Now, the people who support the read technique says, yeah, but they could always say, well, no, I didn't do either. I didn't do either. But come on, we're dealing pe with people like Jesse, uh, Miss Kelly. Right. And, and people and like Brandon Dassey and all those. Yeah. Brandon Dassey and, and Corey Wise. Which by the way, they always focus on first and remember two, like in the case of the West Memphis three, Jesse, Miss Kelly's trial was first. Yes. They knew that it'd be their strongest one because he was the, the weakest of all the mm -hmm. <laughs> defendants. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy, man. Not fair. So, and then they, they go into the nine steps of the interrogation. Positive confrontation. They advise the subject that the evidence has led the police to this individual as a suspect, and they offer the person an early opportunity to explain why the offense took place. Not did you do it. Or right. how'd you do it, but why'd you do it? And they try to shift the blame away from the suspect to some other person. Going to give him an out. Right. Well, they did that with all the other kids, too. Well, well that's what you talked about that you learned from MHMR is to always give somebody an out. Uh-huh. Whenever you're, you're dealing with, with a confrontation, right? Uh-huh. Always give them a way out. You don't want to paint anybody into a corner. And what they're do here is they give them a false way out. Right. Just like they offered... Uh, uh, Jason Baldwin, five years. Right. We'll give you five years. Just roll over on just, Damien. Just roll over on Damien. Say say that weird goth guy over there is the one who who did it, and we'll let you off with five years. Yeah. And Jason wouldn't do it. Nope. So they go to court, and Jason was facing the death penalty. Mm -hmm. They didn't go to court for five years. They didn't go to court for life. They went and asked that jury to put Jason to death. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's a real temptation to, well, you know, we're going to get the death penalty on you. We're going to get the death penalty. Jeez. And you could get out right now for five years. So do you want behind what? Do you want what's behind door number one or door number two? Yeah. You know, it's, it's let's make a deal. God. Nothing to do with the facts. Just let's make a deal. It's crazy. Give me somebody to set up. And they, minimize the frequency of the suspect's denials. So just like cut in and say, no, 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 no. We no, know that's not true. Mm, no, that's not true, Vic. Yeah. We know you did it, Vic. Yeah. Minimize the denials. And if they ask for an attorney, just ignore it. <laughs> they just ignore it. <laughs> I want an attorney. <laughs> well, you don't really want an attorney. You know, an attorney's just going to mess things up for you. Uh, you get an attorney in here, it's going to make you look guilty. Now, right. we have a constitution that says you have a right to an attorney. You have a right to have an attorney present during any questioning. Mm -hmm. And even more important than that is that you have a right to remain silent. Right, 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 right. Now, here's the problem with that. Mm -hmm. Everybody has the right to remain silent, but not many people have the ability. <laughs> That's true. Isn't it? That's true. Especially when you're under the hot lights. Yeah. And when they do this read technique, it's always in a small room 
with minimal furniture. They got the the suspect sitting over in a corner. Yeah. There's usually not even a table in the room. All these tables you see on TV, you know, where I'm over here and you're over there. No. Most of the time, unless they need to have them handcuffed to something, they're just sitting in a chair because they're they the police want them to feel vulnerable. Right. And the police are always between the suspect and the door. Right. And what a lot of people don't know, too, is that you have a right to get up and leave. Yep. yep. If yep. you are not under arrest, if you are only being interrogated, you can say, I not only I want to be quiet, I want a lawyer, but you can say, now I'm leaving. And unless you arrest me right now, I'm walking out that door. Yeah. And hopefully the video camera is going so they can't tase you and kick the crap out of you and put you back in the chair. That's a whole different technique. Whole different technique. Fortunately, <laughs> that doesn't happen as much as it used to. That kind of started going away in the 60s and 70s. Good. But it used to be a really standard law enforcement technique prior to the 1960s. Crazy, It dude. did. And when I've talked before about finding out things the Texas Rangers did that you know, that they would, they'd be ashamed of, or I would sure. be ashamed of sure. that they had done in the past. Yeah. Put it in context because yeah. all law enforcement did that in the past. Yeah. All law enforcement, even our federal law enforcement did that in the past. And the stuff they use today is a lot more sophisticated. It's a lot more psychological. It's still the, the thumb screws, mm -hmm. but they're not on your thumbs. They, it's in your brain. Yeah, it is they, the read technique. Yeah, it's the read technique. And sometimes these things go on for hours. Sometimes mm -hmm. they go on for days. Yeah. With their mother standing out in the hall saying, I want my son. I want him out of here. Mom, if you're out in that hall, get on the phone and call a lawyer. Yeah. Even if you can't afford one, key, stay on the phone because you're going to find somebody who's willing to come down. Right. You'll find somebody who's offended by injustice who will come down and get your son or daughter out of that room. Yep. And, and people, listen to me here. You have a right to remain silent. You have a right to an attorney. And if you are not under arrest, you have a right to leave. Yes. Wow. When I was watching When They See Us, mm -hmm. and they were doing that to poor old Corey Wise, and I kept going, please get up and leave. Just get up and leave. Just tell them you're leaving. But they can be so intimidating. Well, yeah, and that whole thing of, well, if you are going to leave that, it, like you said, implies guilt. Or if you ask for an attorney, well, it must be they're guilty because they're asking for it. I mean, it for you to defend yourself implies guilt. Uh-huh. That's what they say. Yep. But the Constitution also says if you uh, assert one of your constitutional rights, they cannot use that against you in your trial. Love it. You take the Fifth Amendment. They can't say that you took the Fifth Amendment. You get up and walk out, they can't say it because that's your right. Mm -hmm. How can they use something against you to prove you're guilty when you're just exercising your constitutional right? Right. They can't. There's even Fifth Circuit law on that, and the Fifth Circuit is one of the most conservative circuits in the United States, and even the Fifth Circuit says they can't hold it against you. They can't tell the jury that you exercised your constitutional right. Excellent. To try to use the exercise of a constitutional right to imply guilt, there's just something perverted about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Crazy. So they, they, uh, they pose these alternative questions given two choices for what happened, one more socially acceptable than the other. The suspect is expected to choose the easier option, but whichever alternative the suspect chooses... Guilt is admitted. Right. And then once you admit the guilt, then they start changing You're done. Everything. You're done. And you remember Jason. Right. Uh, he was telling us about how Jesse, in his confession, says, yeah, me and Jason, and uh, uh, we had been skipping school. Yeah. And we skipped school that day, and then we saw these kids. Well, Jason's mom figured out that he had not skipped school. She actually got the school to reopen so right. that she could get the records and take them to the police and say, see, he my was son school. was in school that day. And so then what did the police do? Did they say, oh, wow, we must have the wrong people? No. Nope. They go back to Jesse 
and they say, take this out. Yep. So y'all weren't skipping school. You were just mistaken about that, weren't you? You weren't really skipping school. So they do just like Boutwell did with Lucas mm -hmm. and construct this confession so that eventually it comports with the corroborating evidence. Right. And most of the time there is no corroborating evidence to the confession. They've just uh, manipulated the evidence. Jeez. Yeah. And they, they use it especially on juveniles and people with mental disabilities, and in, uh, including reduced intellectual capacity. Right. Right. Of the 311 people exonerated through post-conviction DNA testing, more than a quarter had given false confessions, including those convicted in such notorious cases as the Central Park Five. Right. You know, when they see us. So God help any of our listeners, whoever can <laughs> have the uh, read technique used on them, Vic. Well, don't let it be used on you. Yep. Do not engage. Uh <clears throat> my my advice here is don't dialogue with the devil. I like it. Don't dialogue with the devil. Uh, they're out to get you. They're out to lock you up. They don't care about what the truth is. And I'm not talking about all of them. Right, right. But if you're pulled in for something you didn't do and they're trying to get you to confess to it, that's what they're doing to you. Yep. So stand up on your constitutional rights and exercise those rights. You know, Jonathan, several European countries have... Uh, they prohibited banned it. it. Banned it. Banned Don't do it. it. Yeah. And yeah. in 2015, uh, eight organizations, including the John E. Reed and Associates organization. Which is what transpired. So Mr. Reed passed away, but this entity continued on. They continued on, man. And they trained thousands of people in this technique. Mm -hmm. Well, they settled with a guy named John Rivera. John Rivera was wrongfully convicted of the 1992 rape and murder of 11-year-old Holly Staker. A number of pieces of evidence excluded Rivera, including DNA from the rape kit and, the, get this, and the report from the electronic ankle monitor he was wearing at the time. Wow. He, he was awaiting trial for a nonviolent burglary and had an electronic ankle monitor on that proved he was somewhere else. Wow. Now, how did they get around that? I don't know, but they did. But he falsely confessed to the Staker crime, and after being interrogated by the police for several days, wow. and after taking two polygraph examinations at Reed and Associates, after his exoneration, Rivera filed the lawsuit for false arrest and malicious prosecution. The case was settled out of court with Johnny Reed and Associates paying two million dollars, good, which isn't enough. Well, a million dollars isn't near what it used to be, man. It used to be million dollars is big bucks. You know, they actually say you can't even retire off a million, or you need a million now to re to retire. Probably That's takes more than that to be able to afford health care and all that. Yeah. Crazy. Guess it depends on how old you are when you retire. True. I don't. I don't think I'm ever going to retire, Jonathan. I'm nah, just, don't slow down. I'm having too much fun to retire. <laughs> I'm having too much fun with this. Yeah. <laughs> so it, interesting, Vic. Very, very interesting. I'm fascinated by this yeah. stuff. So people, if you get arrested, call a lawyer. Yeah, call a lawyer. A policeman is not your friend. He's there to lock you up. He's not your friend any more than these insurance companies are your friend if you get in a car wreck. Truth. They are not your friend. They are not your good neighbor. You're <laughs> not under their umbrella. You're out in the rain all on your own. Do not trust them. Call a lawyer. Yep. It doesn't have to be me. I wish you would call me, but if not, <laughs> call somebody to protect your rights instead of letting that insurance company pick your pocket. Yep. If you get arrested, if you even think you might get arrested, if you're being investigated, if you even think think you're invest being investigated get with a lawyer Boom. because they if you even think you're being investigated they've probably been looking at you for a long time <laughs> they are front loading their case they're getting it ready to pull you in set you in a corner turn on the hot lights tell you they got <laughs> dna tell you they got fingerprints tell you they got eyewitness testimony tell you they got all kinds of stuff that they don't have they don't trying have. to get you to confess and trying to get you to roll on your they call them your fall partner f-a-l-l -L, fall partner get you to roll on your fall partner and say 
okay, I was involved, but he's the one who actually did the stabbing. He's right. the one who actually pulled the trigger. You know, don't lie. Don't lie. Even if somebody is offering you an incentive to lie, don't lie to get out of trouble. It only gets you in more trouble. Mm-hmm. Mark Twain has the most wonderful quote. He says, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's I true. love it. Thank you for listening to the Vic Fazell Show podcast. We're a primary source podcast. We talk about people we've known, things we've experienced. We're a primary source podcast. For more information, visit vicfazell.com. Leave us a comment or a review. Subscribe to our YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook pages. And thank you for listening. Share us with your friends. This is Texas singer-songwriter Brian Burns, and I've been to Waco, Heiko, Hondo, Navasota, Winsboro, Jacksboro, Hillsborough, Santa Rosa, Austin, Houston, Galveston, Texacana, Frisco, Buffalo, Conroe, Corsicana, and that's just in the last week. Keep a safe pace, folks. Relax and drive laid back. Because Texas is a laid-back place. And if you've been in a car wreck, call Vic Fazell at 877-WITH-VIC. With principal offices in Waco and Austin, Texas.